On this episode of Game Dev Hideout, Daniel speaks with Chase, the main dev creating Eternal Remnant. Chase was great to talk to, and his game looks fantastic. Then, after the break, I speak with Brandon Truster, the dev behind How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Enjoy the End of the World. Both of these turn-based games are worth checking out. We hope you enjoy hearing about their game dev journeys. This is Daniel, and today I am joined with Chase, the creator of Eternal Remnant. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you, Daniel. How are you? I'm doing great. So Eternal Remnant is this... So actually, let's back up a little. Um, How long have you been making games? Oh, um, I haven't been making games very long at all. In fact, um, Eternal Remnant is like my first kind of foray into into game making, I suppose, although it has lasted a, a number of years by this point. So I'm a little bit more seasoned than I was when I first started. Mm-hmm. So what sort of pushed you into wanting to make a game? Um, well, I've always been, I guess I've always been uh, motivated to engage people in storytelling. And I've explored like a few different mediums. Um, throughout my life in um, in that. And I thought it was filmmaking, so I, I got myself off to film school and, you know, all that student debt later discovered that. Mm, I'm not quite sure if, if that's what it is, although I still really like films. Um, I think that um, I think that the ability to tell a story in a game is, um, although there's still constraints, they're not really conceptual constraints, whereas in filmmaking there's, like, a lot of practical constraints, right? So... Mm -hmm. I was in film school and now I'm sort of wondering like, how do I do this cheaply? (laughs) So, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think, I think you probably can do a lot with it now as well, right? With, with, you know, all all the stuff you can do in Unreal and whatnot. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's more advanced ways and more easier workflows to, to get more, uh, you know, bizarre ideas and and fantastical ideas out there. So is it the, the interactive storytelling that makes designing a game appealing? Uh, yeah, that that is a big part of it. Although um, I, I I think the I think the type of stories I like to tell um, less open ended and more sort of focused on like a a central theme. I think it's more just the um, the presentation of that story. So this is Eternal Remnant. Uh, what what's the game about? Well, oh, pitch pitch time. Um, <laughs> Eternal Remnant is uh, is a narrative RPG that's designed for people um, that. Uh, want a very digestible, bingeable, um, story-driven experience. It's follows, it follows two siblings that are on the run um, who have to flee their home and uh, survive in the wilds uh, on their own. Um, after one of them inadvertently discovers um, he can use some pretty dangerous and volatile powers. And of course, this leads to all sorts of uh, perilous and uh, you know emotional uh, it leads to a perilous and emotional journey of self-discovery. Um, in terms of gameplay, I'm going to say it. It takes systems from all the old classic retro RPGs that we all love, but it. Um, I try to apply uh, modern sensibilities to them so that it's a very sort of breezy, um, comfortable experience. And um, so it takes things like uh, limit breaks and combos and ATB, and it wraps them up in a, a package of about five to six hours for the first chapter anyway. Okay, so based on how modern gaming is, that's one sitting. <laughs> yeah, that's one sitting. <laughs> and if and if uh, if you're if you're uh, an adult with kids and a mortgage, it might be an entire game. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. We've talked to a few other people that are starting to shift game times lower to right. accommodate older busier gamers whereas your 200 hour like xenoblade chronicles might rule out for a lot of people who would be playing it for five years a lot of people yeah. can pick up these shorter games and actually get to play them and 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 what and you think uh and and what which camp do you kind of fall under yourself uh i'm probably a little in the middle so yeah. i'm 30 so i have sort of the 
like I'm busy with work, but I don't have kids yet. So I tend to have a decent amount of time to game depending on how everything's going. So probably somewhere in the middle. I think it's fun to be able to play more games than be playing one game for a long, long time. So some of these like more bite sized games are pretty appealing to me. Yeah, I think I put myself in the same camp. I, 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 if I'm going to do a long game, it's kind of in bite chunks anyway, but yeah. Because it requires a big commitment to, to take off one of these 200-hour things. It does, and especially if you want to follow the, the story in a cohesive way as well. Um, if you put down Tales of Arise or, or FF7R and you come back to it if, a few weeks later, you might not, you might not have like a, you know, a, a solid you know, line from, from A to B in your, in your mind as to where am I now and what am I doing? What just happened? <laughs> what just happened? Yeah. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Because I think that the the longer like if it's a great story, I'll play whatever. Like the time limit doesn't super affect me. It's just if the time limit is cuz I have to grind for 30 hours between each like chapter or boss battle, that doesn't really interest me. But if it's like a good story that's like flowing along and it's a really long story, that's fine. Yeah. I um I always appreciate as a kid playing games where um, you put in, it, it, I sort of saw it as like putting in work to get to the next story beat and the cutscenes were like the reward for doing a bit of grinding or, or getting through a dungeon or fighting a really hard boss. Like if, it, if it's worth it, I'll play a 300 hour game. It's just, mm-hmm. I don't want to be like wandering around in your open world that doesn't have too much in it because I can't find the next thing I need to find. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so with this game... Um, you said it follows a lot of like the the JRPG sort of like style, but you've updated it. Does that mean that you sort of help the grinding a little? So it's not well, I, I don't want to. I I wouldn't presuppose that I um that I've I've taken something that wasn't broken and and updated it. It's more that um you know I, I guess rewriting the book on on any RPG battle system is a, is a huge feat, and I think that um I've tried to take what. I like about it and what I think is manageable from a design perspective. And yeah, exactly as you say, and make it breezier, um, make it um, more um, smoother for players to get from point A to B so they can really engage in the story and not get caught up on, um, not get caught off on any any particular battles, at least not this early on in the game. And also um, offer, you know, a sufficiently complicated battle system without being overbearing i think and then it says here that um there's a lot are there a lot of like playable characters so the 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 there are six um main playable protagonists in the first chapter you get access to three of those um protagonists um although uh, our, our primary uh, protagonist protagonists, uh, Aaron and Vera, the siblings, um, sort of take the spotlight for a large part of the story. And the supporting characters, um, you know, link link and have threads in the story that are important in their own ways. But I really wanted the, the central focus to be on uh, character relationships and specifically the the sort of the, the bond between Aaron and Vera and what they have to go through and the courage they have to observe in, in the face of loss and and uh and hardship yeah cool so are you working on this with a couple of different people or are you doing everything yourself it's it's a it's it's a it's a strange arrangement it's it's me by myself as as arc finder studios but um along the way i've had many people um help in in terms of freelance services um when i felt that the project um had something to offer more than just as perhaps just my hobby i thought that um it might it was worth getting on board some contractors and that's when a lot of a lot of the the meat and potatoes of the game really came to life like we got the ui implemented we um we refined the battle system and a large part of that was just being <laughs> was just identifying what as a developer i'm not very good at and being okay like what can i not do and what do i have to get other people to do because i'm not as good at it and and making those kind of um, concessions and stepping back from certain things to make sure that as a game it was working as a game and and not just as something that I um, that I was putting together in my own complete vision. 
Mm -hmm. And that can be kind of tricky too to say, my skill isn't up to doing this part. I'm going to have to bring someone else in because then you're sort of. Yeah, it's it's enormously tricky. And sometimes, yeah, there there were a couple of times in in the process where it was brought to my attention that, you know, this is this is probably, you know, not the right move. And maybe I do need to change the scene. And maybe for the sake of the game, I um, I do need to make this boss be less of an HP sponge or or something <laughs> like that. When creating the story, did what sort of inspired the story? Like other video games, other books? It sounds like you have interest in kind of a wide range of media. Yeah, actually, the maybe one of the biggest influences is um, just in terms of the dialogue, um, style. It's going to sound bizarre, but actually, um, Vince Gilligan and um, I've been watching a lot of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, <laughs> and I love the way that um, you can be watching watching the show, and a scene is presented to you, and you don't have all the pieces of it, um, and you're not sure why it's important, um, and only at the end of the episode do you, you you might not even remember the scene, but if you rewatch that same episode. There is a there is a very logical and linear path for how a character gets from A to B, and it's very interesting to watch. Now that obviously that's just dialogue. The story itself of Breaking Bad doesn't have anything to do with a kid with powers in a fantasy world. <laughs> but um, but yeah, there are a lot of writing influences like that um, that I um, that I draw from. Even Pix- a lot of Pixar films to some extent. Um, I really like the way they play with heartstrings. Um, in terms of the the concept of the story. Um, it's, it's quite strange. I, um, I lost my father about six, six, seven years ago now. And sometime after that, I remember just standing in the shower and I was thinking, well, life seems, um, life seems like really short. And I was trying to figure out like how I want to spend it. And when I thought about the creative mediums I was engaging in, I wasn't getting a lot of fulfillment out of them. And I thought, um, yeah, I'd really like to, I'd really like to go back to, um, you know, working with games because I used to, I used to fiddle with, um, you know, mods and, you know, campaign editors and stuff like Age of Empires and um, Operation Flashpoint was another one. And just, just tinkering with games without actually making games. And I thought, well, I was really happy in that space. So I wanted to, I wanted to get back in there and spend more time. And so I I just dedicated a little bit more um, time into learning those skills. And yeah, I, I think I'm in a pretty happy place right now. That's awesome. And I uh, love hearing Age of Empires stuff come up. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it was um, it was Age of Empires, but it was also the Star Wars reskin, which was called Galactic Battlegrounds, if you've ever played that. I've not played that. that I would like to, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was neat. <laughs> so you were modding a lot of games then? Uh, I was Well, sort of. Um, I, yeah, anything from like doing little art assets or or you know installing mods or um, or doing a little bit of um, campaign design or, or something like that. Yeah, but I, I like to I like to just fiddle and tinker. Mm-hmm. We've been thinking about um, getting trying to get some modders on because I think that's like super cool how people go in and like tweak stuff or like add themselves to games or especially like the older games that you know we're never getting a sequel for, but they go in and like make a fan game or like mod the original. So it's like we're three playing kind of thing. Yeah, that that w- I would love to. I would love to listen to a podcast on that because I I'd be especially interested in the RPG world. Um, like what 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 some of the folks have done with um, Final Fantasy VI. Um, I forget what the mod was called, but um, yeah, there's some incredible stuff that's been done with that. Mm-hmm. So if you're a modder and you're listening and you want to come on the show, you, you know where to find us. <laughs> but um, and do you have sort of like an anticipated like release date these um these episodes are essentially timeless in a lot of ways but like do you have like an expected year you'd like it to come out so if you'd asked me at the start of this year i would have said this year um for sure um but um i'm just waiting on um what how can i say uh i'm just i'm just waiting on a couple of uh events i can't explain to um to to transpire to kind of dictate how the release pattern is going to go especially for the first chapter one thing i will say is that um is that the episodic nature of the game um is was sort of a conscious choice 
in terms of my position as an as an independent developer as well um of course i think most people that play rpgs probably in around our age group um especially would would like to just make a complete game, uh, you know, a, a, a 30 to however many hours um, RPG of their dreams and put that out the door and people pay for it once and they and then they and then they keep it. Um, mm-hmm. But because because working on a game by yourself is such a slog, I thought it would be a good idea to um, shorten the scope so I could actually like get something out there. And then hopefully that would um, uh, provide some momentum in terms of getting the, the 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 rest of the game out there so um if that's if that's still the case then um 2022 yeah that looks it looks like it could happen um or it may be 2023 it's difficult mm-hmm. to say at this point yeah it's not really a fair question and we're kind of more interested in like process rather than result because obviously taking on making a game is huge <laughs> It's yeah. not like something you're just like walking through the mall one day and you're like, oh, I think I'll just make a game real quick. So it it is huge, and I and I and I think that's why me and uh, like obviously a lot of the other folks that you've interviewed are really appreciative of of just being on a, a podcast and being able to talk about it because when you're working on a game, you're so close to it, and there are so many hours just spent in a dark room in front of a laptop, you know, with a bag of chips or something <laughs> and um and yeah it's nice just to step back and kind of see the macro and talk about it so yeah i really appreciate it off uh off the whole thing yeah and uh, again like it's hundreds of hours and figuring out stuff that you may never have known before it definitely shouldn't like be downplayed even if like your game like even if you only get to the point of like a demo yeah, it, it, even even getting the demo, it was a massive relief um, when, when we when we did finally put it on um, put it on itch and then later Steam. It was like okay, like we got something out the door. Exactly, and like again for like people that are just doing this in their bedrooms or living rooms, that's a huge time commitment. And the demos are all really impressive. And then especially, for- I've seen some fantastic um, RPG demos this year from indie developers. There are some really good ones. Mm-hmm. There's some very cool ones out this year. So if you want to come on and talk about your demo, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep silently plugging people if they're interested. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I believe we found you through Twitter. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. We. Um, I remember. Um, I remember having chat to you a while back. I think so. That's where we tend to find a lot of people because there's such a great little community of specifically rpg devs that work together to help promote each other which is pretty cool yeah everyone's super supportive um there's you know i've never really had a a negative experience with any other dev or anything like that it's all been super positive and everyone seems like pretty pretty helpful to each other too where if you have a question generally somebody will help you out (laughs) yeah there's never a shortage of help Mm -hmm. and um and the i mean especially in the RPG maker community, which I, I'm more familiar with. Um, mm-hmm. But um, even even in indie Twitter in general seems to be an incredibly supportive environment. Definitely. So with your demo that's come out, have you gotten like a nice response about it yet? Or do you need more yeah. people to try it? Um, overall feedback's been um, really positive for the demo. Um, I, I personally can't just, I, I really want people to play the rest of it. I, I just can't wait for people to, to if, if they like the demo, I can't wait to see how they react when, you know, certain beats in the story happen and stuff happens later. Um, but um, I am very um, pleased with the feedback that's come in. We've had some, um, we've had some feedback, which has um, made me want to go back and adjust some stuff. Um, people have suggested certain options be in the game um, for scene playback speed and text and, uh, text display and stuff like that so we've gone okay and i've gone back in and and we've we've implemented those so um the first round of feedback for the demo is really good and hopefully pretty soon we should have a another demo available um and we'll anticipate another round of feedback for that as well very cool so do you like have the game designing bug now like after you finish this game do you have like a sequel planned or do you just are you, you going to do another game did this scratch the itch and you're you're done <laughs> Well I think I do want to move into games yeah I I think um 
I think I do feel comfortable in this space, um, even though um, even though <laughs> there are a lot of a lot of skills I don't have. Um, being able to sort of manage a project, um, you know, of of this scale, I mean, I suppose it does have some similarities with um, uh, filmmaking in, in 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 some ways as well in terms of managing like a, a large group of people, um, and. I've really enjoyed the the whole experience, even even when it's been tough. It's been um, to sort of create something to your vision, and then see it executed, and is 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 especially rewarding. Um, however, I am aware that like working on your indie project is not what working in the game industry is. It's not really reflective of that. They're like two completely different beasts, and there's probably always going to be the game that you make for fun, and then the games that you work on for money. And that might be a reality of it, but I, yeah, I still think it's a, um, engaging and fun space to work in. And I think it allows you to do exactly what you want versus yeah. someone saying you have to add in more X or Y or whatever it might be. Yeah, it's as much therapeutic as it is, um, as it is rewarding, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So um, is the best way for people to find you through Twitter or do you have a website or... Yeah, tw tw a Twitter follow is always nice. Uh, a follow on the a wish list on Steam is always nice. Um, on on itch as well, if if that's your mode of preference. But um, yeah, I think I think um, I think the the thing that helps us most is if is if people do get time and and they and they do think the idea of the game is interesting or they see a trailer is to is to give it us a know and, and give it a go and and um, let let us know what they think. Well, I won't keep you any longer because I know it's super late there. <laughs> <laughs> thanks daniel <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on yeah thank you thank you very much i enjoyed it and uh we'll have to get you back on when the game's fully released so we can talk about all the the spoilers that you won't give us now <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah i'd love to, love to love spo I, I, i'm on the verge of spoiling the whole thing now so i better go before um, i blurt the whole thing out <laughs> exactly don't let the cat out of the bag <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, okay Thank you so much. Um, everybody should go check out the Eternal Remnant uh, demo that's currently available on Steam. And if you're listening to this in the future, um, the second demo might be out or the full game might be out. So either way, Chase has worked really hard. Go support his game. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Hey there, podcast listeners. I am David. And I'm Kate. And together we host a podcast that you might be interested in if you like The Legend of Zelda. There are lots of awesome podcasts out there and a lot of awesome Zelda podcasts <laughs> out there. That's right, Kate. And we are another one of them. In fact, that is the name of our show, Another Zelda Podcast. And in our show in particular, we talk about some of our favorite dungeons, characters, boss battles. We do a couple top ten lists here and there. We have some deep dive episodes and we even pepper in a couple of quiz episodes. Episodes. We talk about our own experiences, we do some review episodes, talk about our challenges, our struggles, and our victories. That's right. If it has to do with Legend of Zelda, we talk about it. You can check out our episodes on our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and a lot of the other podcast services that are out there. And you can also check out our episodes on our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com. All right, we will see you there. Okay, bye! Hey, today I'm joined with Brandon um, of PSA Games. Is that like the best like name to find you under? Uh, as far as Twitter is concerned, you can find me under at Brandon Truster with the B on Brandon capitalized and the T on Truster capitalized. Yes, that's the best way to go home. Perfect. So we're here talking about your game and your game has a very long title. So I think I'll have you say it. <laughs> How I learned to stop worrying and enjoy the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so is this um, so actually tell us a little about yourself. Uh, you know, I'm just a guy. My dad was 
a member of a biker gang when I was born. My mom's a redneck hippie and they broke it off when I was maybe five years old. And then my life was like going over to this town and moving with mom and then going back to dad and like going back to mom and going back to dad for like 15 years or so. I'm just like moving from one state to another, never having firm roots and that sort of thing. And I'm going to guess that's probably a huge influence on what I'm about. Probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I never got to make any friends really. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Make a friend. Hey, I have to move. Bye. You know, it's, it was kind of basically like that. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So what made you want to make your own game? I, you know, ever since I was a kid and I got my, I got a Nintendo when I was like maybe fourth grade or so. Um, I wanted to make games back then, but I come from a poor family. So the way I compensated for that is I would, uh, my parents could afford notebooks and paper, you know, pens and stuff. So I just draw out video game ideas. I draw levels out and I play them in my mind. I just look at the paper like I was tripping on something <laughs> and play the games in my mind. And But I never took it a step further because, you know, I had it in my head that I was going to be a comic strip artist. That's, that was my first foray into creativity was making comic strips. And, and that didn't pan out. <laughs> that didn't pan out. Not yet. Not yet, no. But I'm kind of taking that same school of thought and applying it to the game I'm developing. It's kind of a living comic strip in a way, yeah. Okay. So, so what's your what what's your game about? Uh, so my game is the conspiracy theorists of the world will love it because that's exactly what it is. It is tackling conspiracy theories. Um, I used to work for the government. And through that job, I learned of some like shady stuff, you know, like our government and corporations are up to things. And one of those things that almost seems as if there is maybe an agenda against poor, humble, you know, your poor huddled masses. It's maybe an agenda to get rid of those people in a way. And we might be seeing that unfold with like the COVID thing and all that. But, um, you know, once that started happening, I got in my head, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I need to warn people about this in some way. I've tried warning people about this sort of thing in the past, but it didn't work. And I thought, well, maybe I'm doing it the wrong way. Maybe I need to take that information, turn it into a video game. And then maybe then people will start to listen and maybe understand what's really going on. But it's kind of a slow process. I don't think I'm being fast enough. (laughs) (laughs) It might be too late. By the time my game's released, it might be too late. We might be up to our necks and... 1984 basically but that's one of the things that made me want to make the game plus it's kind of fun there's some fun involved with making a game it's like a problem solution thing create a game there's a glitch now now i have to figure out how to get rid of that glitch and when you do it you feel like you're on top of the world (laughs) basically yeah Mm -hmm. so are you naturally a programmer or have you like self-taught yourself a lot of things I'm mostly self-taught on most things. Um, I did go to art school for like painting and doing like that sort of thing. But I don't think that really contributed too much to my art style or any of that because I was already established. My, at least from how I feel, I felt like I was already established. I already had an art style and a vision. I think the art teacher was mostly there to encourage me, I guess you could say. She, she encouraged me. It's like, keep doing art, Brandon. You're going to be something someday. And it turns out it's not too true, but. Um, hey, you're, you're using it. You're, you're making a game. I'm using it, yeah. I mean, art and music are both skills related to the game development. So, I mean, that's why I kind of jumped into it because I wanted to take those skills and put them into a different use, I guess. <laughs> Uh, So all the, literally all the characters in my game are more or less either loosely or actually based on real people. I won't give too much information about the protagonist, because that's kind of a joke in the game. You never really learn too much about him. You never learn his real name. And he's kind of a personality chameleon. His personality fits the situation as the situation changes. So he's confident when he needs to be, you know what I mean, changes. But as far as the rest of the cast is concerned, you know, they're all based off people I know really well. 
and many of them I do have their consent to use their likeness in my game. Uh, so the Matt character, he's based off my friend Matt Younger. He's the only party member who actually has formal military and combat training. That's why he's useful. But he's also really cynical because life handed him a really bad hand of cards. So <laughs> yeah, he's cynical. And the elite female is based off a girl I dated. She vanished at some point. I don't know what happened to her. She might be dead. I don't know. I honestly don't know. But she had this extremely powerful flamboyant personality. She was the kind of person who could walk up to any random stranger, start a conversation with them, and not even bat an eye. She was not afraid of anyone. She is a very fearless person. And she isn't the smartest person. But she is totally fearless. And I thought that would make a really good chemistry, you know, between the other characters, her, she's kind of the opposite of the male characters. She's more fearless than they are. Even the villains are kind of based off of real people. I don't know Bill Gates personally, <laughs> but the main villain is technically based off of him. <laughs> okay. Kind of makes fun of him a little bit, but his name's Gil Bates instead of Bill Gates. I thought that was a nice little anagram in there. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the Bates Hotel, like the Psycho movie. Mm -hmm. Except I kind of based them off of my friend's perception of me. Uh, when the Xbox came out, my friend used to make fun of them by being like, Hi, I'm Bill Gates. You're just going to love my new Xbox. It's got better graphics or whatever. But I can turn that into a character. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sounds pretty cool. So it's very based on real world stuff. Events, yeah. I mean, from what I can tell, the world isn't coming to an end, but there is definitely a noticeable pattern of people. If you look at healthcare, you're dying, life's on the line, they need healthcare to save your life. That's going to cost you more money than you can possibly make. And to me, that just, that's a red flag that just screams, hey, it isn't our intention to save lives of the poor people. We're here to save the lives of people who can fork out the money, you know, like the millionaires and billionaires and stuff. And so I basically took that idea and I kind of embellished it quite a bit to make it funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's a lot of satire? Yeah, it's social satire for sure. Cool. And then this is a turn-based game? Yeah, it's a turn-based role-playing game. Uh, to, and I've heard a lot of people mention that games that are made with rpg maker especially xp they, they all feel the same that's what they tell me right mm -hmm. so when i start developing the game i'm like well how what can i do to make the game feel less like it is an rpg maker xp game and that's why i come upon the idea of making it more like a survival horror turn-based game in survival horror games it's all about conserving the ammo you have the ammo you want to use it but if you use too much of it, you're out of it. And then when you get to the boss, you're kind of screwed, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I based my game around that. So you're allotted a certain amount of ammo. And then you have the melee weapon, which does weak damage. And it's there to finish the enemy off, basically. So, um, yeah. You can judge the enemy's HP based off their size. A little enemy's got low HP. So, yeah, you can kill them with the knife or the ball bat or whatever melee weapon you have. But in the bigger enemies, you usually want to strategize this way. You want to, like, shoot them once or twice and get their health down. Then save the ammo and finish them off with the melee weapon like you would in, like, Resident Evil kind of thing. You know, you shoot the zombie a couple times, maybe finish it off with a knife, and then you save the ammo. That's where the challenge comes in is... Being conservative with that ammo, you don't want to run out of it. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, looking at it, you wouldn't necessarily immediately think it was made in RPG Maker. So it looks like you you've put a lot of your own stamp on it. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm trying to do. It's a slow process. <laughs> It's like that Johnny Cash song, one piece at a time. He steals one little piece of a car at a time and he builds his own car outside the factory. That's kind of what I'm doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So are you doing this completely solo? Um, for the most part, um, recently I got the idea in my head that I want my characters to have voices in battle. So when they do their special moves, 
for example, the Matt character, um, all of his moves are basically parodies of Street Fighter II. So he has like the dragon punch, but you know, he, he says it the way it sounds like it sounds in the game. He's like, oh, you get really, I'm a fan of most games except for like first person shooters, but I'd say the main influences would be like Dragon Warrior or Quest, depending on your affiliation, Final Fantasy. I almost want to say Earthbound, but I never completed that game. I actually got stuck in that game. I couldn't beat it. I'm stuck in that the neon colored city. I don't know what's called Eagle Land or whatever. I'm mm -hmm. stuck there. I followed the walkthrough to a T and I can't make the next sequence of events occur. Um, and I almost want to say Undertale's an inspiration, but the truth is I haven't played Undertale until last Christmas. I finally bought it and played it for myself. But I've been developing the game for a year and a half before that, so it is an inspiration, and it also isn't because it wasn't hasn't been a part of my life this whole time. You know what I mean? I guess for the most part, uh, when I play that game, those last three little boss fights at the end, where you fight uh, uh, the king, I don't forget his name, and the flowy, flowy or flowy character, those are like nearly traumatic in a way for me. I mean, this character is threatening to erase my save file and all that stuff. And it's big up. There's like freaking stuff flying all over the screen. I'm like, how can anyone beat this? But I beat it the first try. But the whole time I'm just like freaking out. And I'm scared. And I start thinking, man, I need to have my final boss fight night game at least be close to being that epic or something. So I haven't made my final boss yet. I haven't figured out how I'm going to do that yet, but. Basically, Gil Base is granted a body by Saturn. So he's like the Satan in my game. Satan is Saturn, basically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's granted a better body so he can beat the protagonist kind of a thing. And I haven't figured out what that body is going to be. I had an idea before, but I'm thinking about scrapping it and trying something else. I just want it to be big. I wanted to end on this huge, traumatic, crazy freak note that leaves an impact on the player. You know what I mean? So what have been some of the, the harder parts of developing it? Just having the time or? Uh, yeah, a big part of it is the time. Um, so when I started developing the game, I was living in Oregon with a guy who grows weed, basically. I was a trimmer for him, right? Mm -hmm. I actually went out there to train to be a marijuana grower and trimmer for my friend back in Oklahoma because his first crop failed, right? I'm out there and then the COVID thing happens, right? And then the news is talking about they might close down interstate travel and all that stuff. I'm like, what? The world's ending. Holy smoke. Holy smokes. So I had to make a crucial decision. Do I stay here and trim pot for this dude? I barely know. Or do I go back to Idaho and stay with family in case, you know, it happens that I can't do that, you know, because they close down interstate travel. I made a decision to come back home and stay with mom. And when I came here, I knew right off the bat that it's not going to be easy for me to find and get a job because my job history is a little flaky. I've been arrested a few times, and that just makes it more difficult to get a regular job, right? Mm -hmm. So I started thinking, it's like, well, what can I do? What can I do to make money? I thought about doing my art thing again. That kind of worked in the past, but it doesn't make a lot of money each month. You know, I might make 200 bucks a month, and that's not going to help too much. Well, what if I try game design? So I you know, I had my mom pay for RBG Maker XP. I had the idea for the game in my head. I started working on it. That was fine for about a year. But what happened is the apartment complex we live in, it's a modest apartment complex. The people who owned it originally, they were nice. They were charging us like 450 a month to stay here. That was nice. That was really freaking nice. Anyways, they got to a point where the, the owner, he couldn't, He's old. He can't do the work anymore. He can't like fix water heaters anymore. He's old and shaky. He's brittle and broken. So they decided to sell the apartment complex to this huge monster corporation. And what did they do? As soon as they bought the complex, they doubled our rent overnight. We went from 450 a month to paying like 700 a month. My mom's like, I can't do this. I can't support you anymore. You have to get a job. So I submitted myself to getting a dishwashing job and I went from working on my game for like 12 to 16 hours every day to four days a week. I might get to work on it two hours, maybe four if I'm lucky. My game would be out by now if I was able to like not have to work, but 
Uh, it is what it is. And I'm here still. I'm still working on it. Mm-hmm. That's basically it. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest challenge is having the time to do it because the job robs me of my time. So what are sort of your like big hopes for the game? Like a Steam release or like something crazy oh. like the Switch or something? <laughs> It would be really cool if I could get it released like on PlayStation, Xbox, and all that stuff. But I didn't do too much research when I downloaded RPG Maker XP. It turns out with that that development tool, if you want to call it that, um, that pretty much limits you to releasing on PC or Steam only. It's not like Unity. Unity, you can release those games on any platform you want, really. But So I'm kind of stuck being on Steam, and you know, that's fine. I've come to love the platform myself recently. I never had a device I could enjoy it with, but once I started, once I got the job that I have, I'm like, well, I now have all the spending money all of a sudden. I started buying and downloading games from Steam and I'm having the time of my life over here. Yeah, there's a lot of really good stuff on Steam. I feel like it sometimes gets a bad rap, but there's like so many great games and like the prices tend to be pretty decent. Yeah, they do. Uh, otherwise, my hopes for the game, there's two other things I want my game to accomplish. One of those is to provide a sustainable living for myself. I want it to at least generate enough money to where I can quit the stupid dishwashing job that I hate <laughs> <laughs> and dedicate all my time to doing you know, game development, art, music, and make that my life because that is the stuff that makes me happy. Other than that, I kind of want my game to be a tool, I guess you could say. I'm hoping my game could be a catalyst. Yeah, a catalyst to break people out of that mindset and be, hey, there's an elephant in the room. It's okay to talk about it and do something about it. I'm hoping, you know, it's almost like a spiritual slap in the face. I said something about Undertale being traumatic at a certain point. And I kind of want my game to have that same effect, but in a way that it causes people to maybe become a little more proactive when it comes to the big problem that's in the room sort of thing, you know? Mm-hmm. I think that's... Or is just... that too much? Should I not be doing that? <laughs> no. Should I not make my game like that? Is that like a bad thing? I'm kind of wondering about that. I might be shooting myself in the foot here. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't think so. Like, it's it's more fun to to play games that are saying something than games that are saying nothing. That's true. You know, I learned a lot from playing Zeno Gears in Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy VII, there's a situation where you have a corporation that's technically governing the world. It's a corporatocracy. I never would have noticed that had I not played that game, that that could be a possibility. And guess what? That's literally the world we live in right now. Corporations pretty much run the show. And like mm-hmm. Seto Gears, I mean, that game is a conspiracy theory. You have a small group of people who live in Solaris, and they control everything that happens on the planet Earth. That's yeah, cool. that's amazing. <laughs> It'll completely change your mind on how you see the world, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> What's sort of the best way for people to support your game? The only social media I can really do right now is Twitter. So my Twitter handle's at Brandon Truster with the B on Brandon and the T on Truster capitalized. You can follow me there and support me that way. Other than that, I'm on Minds.com. I just started an account there like a week ago. I haven't really done too much there. Mm-hmm. I started that account because I got booted off of Twitter for a week because I told the truth and I got put in Twitter jail. I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just that. And uh, just follow me. And when the game comes out, don't be too mad if I charge you 15 or $10 or whatever it is. I don't even know I'm going to charge people for the game yet. Mm-hmm. Just play the game. Understand I'm coming from a place of truth. Please try not to be offended. I know my game has some controversial subject matter and some people are like, oh no, you hurt my feelings. I'm like, I'm just a messenger. <laughs> if I made an observation in this world and I spoke of that observation, there's really no reason for you to be hurt over it because I'm just a human being and I'm just telling you the truth. I want to avoid lying as much as I possibly can. I've been raised on the concept that you don't lie. And I found that telling the truth... <laughs> It gets into a lot of trouble. Thanks, mm-hmm. Twitter, for getting in trouble for being truthful. <laughs> All right. Well, before we wrap up, any any last things about the game that you you want the world to hear? Well, yeah, my, my game, it has, has swear words. Um, it's intended for people who are over the 18 years of age. 
and it's very much in the same vein as South Park. So if you can watch an episode of South Park and not be offended, then you might enjoy my game. And I think maybe the other thing I should say, my game has multiple endings, sort of like Chrono Trigger. But the thing about the endings in my game is each one of them has a good thing that comes coupled with a bad thing. Because to me, that's what real life is all about. Every time you get a wish granted, something bad happens that challenges you. And it's there for a reason. We're supposed to be challenged here. Mm -hmm. So if you take that mindset when you play my game, you will have a good time. Don't expect the Mario Brothers ending <laughs> where you say the princess, everything's good, you get laid and all that stuff. Because in my game, you do say the princess, but that does not guarantee you're going to get lucky, fella. <laughs> Things might not go your way. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to it. <laughs> of course. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Oh, good. I'm glad you had fun. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried I was going to be too like truthful or in your face and make a bad time for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Well, thanks, Daniel. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Bye. All right. Peace. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to continue the conversation with us, you can find us on Twitter at the Turn by Turn Pod. We can also be found on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else podcasts are sold. A five-star review on Apple Podcasts would mean the world. We will talk to you soon. Bye.